today. So we are so excited to be in this place of worship with you guys. Why don't you put your hands together with me? Come on. Take it. 
This is a house of mirrors. 
so good. Well, hey, you may find your seat. And I just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome to everyone that's joining us today. And if this is your first time here, I want to extend a special welcome to you. And you may notice when you came in, there's a baptismal tank over here. And I wish this was like an every week thing, but it may be the reason that there's so much joy, so much energy in the room because we have four or more people every service taking that next step in their faith. And I'm ready to go public with my faith. And here at the bridge, we believe that Jesus has resurrection power and that power runs through our veins. And when we were meeting with these people this week, they were telling their testimony. And one thing that was very similar for everyone's story is that life has its ups and downs. But as soon as they started sharing the story, the hope and the joy that came from God alone and what they're doing today is they take this next step in baptism. They're saying, Jesus is not just some person that we read about in a book. He is someone that is alive and on the move, and their baptisms point directly to that. And I, I just want to make it clear, baptisms, baptisms don't save us. Just like this, this wedding ring doesn't make me married. I'm, I'm married without the ring or not, but when we put on this ring, it indicates that I am married and just like baptism, it's an outward sign that God has done something already on the inside. And so I just wanna read Romans six because it explains baptisms so well. It says, that's what baptism into the life of Jesus means. When we're lowered into the water is like the burial of Jesus and when we're raised out of the water is like the resurrection of Jesus. Each of us is raised into a light-filled world by our Father so that we can see where we're going in our new grace. And so that is what baptism is in a nutshell. Jesus died and rose again in us too. We're born into sin and raised to new life through the power of Jesus. So with that being said, I want to point our attention over to the baptismal tank where we have our elders, uh, Ryan and Jay in the tank this morning, and they're not mic'd up for water reasons, right? But this is what they're going to say. They're going to say, who is your Lord and Savior? And they're going to say with joy, Jesus Christ. And then based on their declaration, we're going to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when they go down the water, we're going to say, buried with Christ in his death. And when they come out of the water, we're going to say, raised to new life. And that's where you come in, church. This is not some boring tradition. This is a celebration a celebration. So I need you to, when they come out of the water, to clap your hands, to go nuts, okay? We got that? So first up, we have Emerson, and what we've done is we picked the spiritual meaning of everyone's name, and Emerson, your name means victorious, and the, the verse our prayer team picked out is Psalm 20, verse 5. It says, may we shout for joy over your victory, and in the name of our God, set up our banners. I love that. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. And raise to new life. Come on, church. Woo! So good, Emerson. Next, we have Cooper Shepherd. Cooper, your name means servant. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 16 says, please follow their instructions and in everything you can to help them, as well as all others like them who work hard at your side with such real devotion. special to me because we, I, I lead a Indian Hills small group of college students every Monday and the, these next two I've had the privilege to walk with and Brooke your name means refreshed I love that you always have a smile on your face and Zechariah 2 verse 10 says sing for joy and be glad O daughter of Zion for behold I am coming and I will dwell in your midst Race to new life! So good! Next, 
next we have Emma. Emma, your name means absolute faith. And church, we got to turn it up a notch this time because it's Emma's birthday, okay? She's getting baptized on her birthday, so we're going to go nuts. But the, the verse we chose for you, Emma, is Mark 11, verse 24. says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and I will have them. Raise the new life! Oh, church, we have a God that's on the move. Come on, let's stand to our feet and give him all the praise. with you. And so God, I just pray blessing over this room and over this space. And Jesus, um, at the end of the day, God, we pray that you have just been glorified. Thank you. We love you. Amen. Hey, can we celebrate our baptisms one more time this morning? How fun. So great to worship with you guys. Go ahead and turn to a neighbor, say hi, ask a fun question, and then have a seat. We haven't had the chance to meet. I'm so glad you're here. And I want to give you a few of the details that are pretty normative, but I want to kind of break it down for you. You should have gotten one of these on your way in with your program. A program is something we have for you to maybe take notes along the way, but there's this connector card. And after you get your pen warmed up, you can on the back write your prayer request. You can write a praise, a celebration. And today, today only, here, we're just playing a little game. I would love it if you would also include how long have you been attending the Bridge Church? It just helps us gauge what the flow is of all the people coming. And let me tell you, growth has been happening. As a church, we're up 68% from last year's attendance and our minds are blown. And we want to get better at communicating with you. And the connector card is one of the ways we do that. Now, 
Others of you, you have been faithfully giving, and that's another normal element on your way in. You get, it's an envelope, and some of you, you text to give. Some of you, you give automatically online through the bridgechurch.cc. Uh, some of you just found out that we now receive stocks through something called Overflow. And what I want to do is I want to kind of open it up a little bit, and you'll see there's a campus because we have four, hello, and there's a general fund and kingdom builders. And in a few weeks, we're taking a kingdom builders offering, and that's basically if you use the write a check, put the cash in, that's the way to designate that. If you do it digitally, there's a way to designate that. But I want to let you know that Kingdom Builders is helping us with future foundations. Yes, it reaches people globally. Yes, it reaches people locally. Yes, it's all in on students. But it's also helping with the facility realities for all the growth we're experiencing. And so we are in these ongoing negotiations with the building in Ottumwa, super excited about that. We have a building in Oskaloosa and we're paying it off and we're super excited about that. And we have something in Centerville and we're super excited. And we're dreaming, we're dreaming, we're dreaming about something in Fairfield. And one of the ways you help move that forward is with Kingdom Builders. So with all that being said, again, I'm so glad you're here. Let me tell you, don't miss next, next week's a week to invite someone and here's why. What you think? Nobody's taking that bet. You two boys are just two weary travelers who lost your way. I can fix it. Good morning, aviators. Venus Williams. What you want? Let's show all of those people that I can handle what's coming. We could be a family. Friends are the family. Welcome to Game Central Station. Pat, coming. Everything changes now. So good. I, I just cannot get enough of baptisms, and seeing that just pumps me up too at the movies. And I would tell you, you, you have to be here. You can't miss it, but you know that, right? You just saw like Top Gun and Popcorn and Church all in the same place. Like, yes, I got to be there. So make sure you come next week, bring a friend. Um, but this week, we are in this series called Toxic. And week one, Becky kicked us off with this message that was so powerful. She's like, there's danger in the power of the tongue. We have to be careful that we don't tear people down. Instead, can we be people that speak life and blessing? And then week two, Joe Anderson, he just came out of nowhere, right? If you were here, like he brought the most powerful testimony saying that there was these influences in his life, these toxic influences such as depression and alcohol that the enemy tried to use to draw him away from the Lord, but instead God saw him through. God is good. And if you have not seen that message, uh, I really uh, suggest go check that out at thebridgechurch.cc. But this week, we are going to talk uh, not about an uh, external toxic habit. We're going to talk about an internal toxic habit which has the, which it's called bitterness, bitterness. And I want to start by asking this question, what makes you bitter? What makes you bitter? What, what things do you hate? And we use that word hate so loosely sometimes because there's several things I hate. Do you know what I hate? I hate bad bed sheets that like just keep falling off of the corner. And you're like, I just did this this morning, but here I am, I'm putting them back on the corner. And the worst is when you're in bed at night and it happens and it like wraps you up like a yummy burrito. And you're like, what? I hate this. You know what I hate? I hate when you're texting someone and on Facebook or iMessage and you see that they're the reply bubble is like, they're typing, and you're like, ooh, what are they going to say? And then all of a sudden, it just disappears. And you're like, what? What were they going to say? And your mind is just left like spinning. And Android users, you have no idea what we're talking about, right? <laughs> Burn. <laughs> but, but you know what else I hate? I hate when 
uh, you order a salad, and they give you enough dressing to cover like two pieces of lettuce. And th at first you're like, okay, now I'm already kicking myself for ordering a salad. But now it's like I have to eat a dry salad. It's the worst. Do you know what I hate? I hate when you're finding that good parking spot, especially when it starts to get cold, and you find that person that's pulling out, they have the reverse lights on. You're like, yes, a VIP spark parking spot just for me. And then they just have like no plans of moving. They just sit there and you're like, I'm going to lose my mind. I hate when that happens. Uh, I hate ice cream shops that stay open during the winter because like who wants ice cream in the winter? I know there's people out there, but I'm just telling you, you're crazy. Like when I drive by ice cream, uh, the Cold Stone Creamery, and there's like 10 people in line and it's like negative 20 degrees out. And you're like, what is wrong with this world? And then there's the classics, right? We all hate people that put an empty milk carton back in the fridge. We all hate people that don't tighten the lids and like it just, like don't put the lids back on. Like that's the worst. And the reason we're laughing is why? Because this is not real bitterness. This is not real. These are just stupid little annoyances we can laugh together about. So let me ask again, what do you really hate? Or maybe a more personal question is who who do you really hate? Because maybe you wouldn't say it out loud that I would like, I hate this person, but doesn't hate have a posture? Doesn't hate have a sound? Because what bitterness is, it's that inner depression. It's that inner hurt that turns into hate. I would define bitterness as this. Bitterness is when we let negative things that happen to us start to live in us. Bitterness is when we let negative things that happen to us start to live within us. We know that if you leave an open wound open, what happens? It becomes infected, and that's what bitterness, if we don't address it, that's what bitterness can do. And so I know there's a lot of reasons for bitterness. There's a lot of things that can make us bitter, but here are a few things that can make us bitter that are very common. One, overpromised. Maybe at some point in your life, you had a significant other, or you had a parent, or you, you had a spouse that promised you that they would never leave you, and then they did, and that left so much hurt, and maybe it's lingered and festered, and it turned into hate, and it caused bitterness. Maybe you had a business partner that promised to pay you, but instead he deceived you, and that caused bitterness. Bitterness can be when you get over-promised. Number two is overlooked. Overlooked. No one notices what I'm doing behind the scenes. No one sees what I'm doing, and instead they got all the credit. Why didn't I get the credit? Instead they got the promotion. Why didn't I get the promotion? Overlooked can cause bitterness. Number three is overused. Overused. They, they, never, they never seem to care that I stay early. I come early and I stay late. They don't see me. They don't care for me. And the last one is overtaken. This is physical or emotional abuse. Overtaken in speech or body. And I, I can feel in the room. Right away we were just laughing. But all of a sudden when I start talking about these things that are, are personal and real, it causes us to tense up. Because these things are real and they happen in a in a dark world. And you may be thinking like, oh man, I made a mistake of coming to church today because I know where this is going to lead. I know they're, they're going to ask me to forgive someone. And I just want to say on the front end, be super clear that I know forgiveness is hard work. I know healing hurts. And if someone would say it doesn't, I don't know if they've experienced true hurt or they've ever had to forgive someone because the reason the natural uh, instinct is to tense up is because the natural instinct of forgiveness is to let go. It reminds me of growing up, uh, I had these grandparents that actually weren't my grandparents. They're my fake grandparents is what I, I, we call them at our house because my parents just decided, like, you're going to call them grandma and grandpa. And I'm like, okay. And in small town Iowa, you ever see that happen before? We're like, we just choose who our family is. I'm like Uncle Cub to so many kids right now, and I love it. But my, my fake grandparents, they are my moral compass. They are the nicest people 
I have ever met. And when I think of a memory, I don't know if you ever have someone in your life that does this, but when you think of a memory of them, there's like a spotlight shining on them. Like that's how nice they are. And so they're the nicest people I've ever met. We would go over to their house every single day after school with my fake cousins, okay? You got fake cousins too. And we would come up with games. Again, small town, Iowa, you have to come up with your own fun. So you, you're really, we're really good at making up our own games that just don't make sense. But I have always been the smallest person in the room. And so any game that caused like me to be physical, I know I had no shot at winning. So I would rig each game to have something to do with speed because I, I, I used to be fast. I'm not fast anymore, but I used to be fast. And we were playing this game with my fake cousin. And over time, I kept winning again again and again, and he got so sick of it that he did what anyone would do when someone's faster than you. He bit my cheek. <laughs> like, we have pictures. Like, he chomped down. Like, what? What? And I've always had, like, the worst pain tolerance. Uh, I, I hate pain, and so, I, and I'm a little dramatic, too, when, I'm, when I have pain. And so I'm, like, on the ground just, like, wailing and crying, and my grandparents, they hear it, and so they, they come out, you know, spotlight shining on them, moving with them, and they go right away, they're like, what happened? And I was like, he bit my face! And they go over to him, and like, is that true? And they're like, yeah, well, say you're sorry. And, you know, he's just one of those, like, he doesn't really mean, like, Sorry. And then they come to me out of my surprise, and they're like, say you forgive them. And when I cry, I like hyperventilate. Like still to this day, I'm just like, <gasps> and so I'm, just, I'm over here just like, ah, ah, ah. and they're like, say you forgive them. I'm like, I, I, I forgive you. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. This just happened two seconds ago. You want me to forgive this person? Like I just want to catch my breath. And thinking back to this story, I think this is sometimes where we miss as a church. And this is sometimes where I miss as a leader because some of you have been really hurt. Some of you have felt so much pain and my intent is not to force you to say, I forgive you at the mouth. My intent is that this would be a place where like me in the story, you can catch your breath. This would be a safe place where you can, you can heal and rather than make you say, I forgive you, that through scripture, you would find the tools and the next steps to be able to say, I forgive you with my heart. And so with that being said, I, I want to jump into scripture because uh, Hebrews talks about bitterness with such like vivid words. Um, the author of Hebrews says, work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. It says, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out. Everyone say, watch out. Watch out. That no poisonous root. That's that, that's that words I was talking about. Listen to that. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Bitterness is one of those things that you think you can keep quiet, but in time it cannot stay contained. In time, it begins to affect more things than you thought it would. You thought it would just like affect your own heart. Like, oh, I can do this. It's just affecting me. But it starts to affect your family. It starts to affect your business. It starts to affect your future. And it is toxic. But the author of Hebrews, what he's saying is that there's an option. You have to get out. You have to twist and pull these poison roots out. So this year... Uh, I took up gardening, actually, for the first time. Uh, I refer to myself at home as the master gardener. Uh, Cora will never call me that, uh, ever. But, and I actually learned that I should not call myself that because I'm so bad at it. I, and I learned quickly that all I know about gardening is, like, things I learned in the Bible. Like, don't put seeds on rocky soil. Don't put seeds in thorny soil. Don't put seeds where people walk. And that's it. That's all I know. But this year, I went for it. Okay, and you're going to laugh, but like I went for it because I planted 100 sunflowers in a row. And I know sunflowers are not that hard to keep alive, but they were for me. And so 100 sunflowers in a row, and not just any sunflowers, but those like huge mammoth ones, the ones that are 13 feet tall, and the stems are literally the size of my body. Okay, so these are huge. And when you have a huge flower, what does that mean about the roots? They're huge. And what I wish someone would have told me on the front end is that 
Someone mentioned after I had all these and I was showing pictures of all these 100, they're like, you know, if you want to do this again next year, you have to dig up the roots so it has enough room for them to grow underground. And I was like, what? Like, I wish I would have known that before 100. But I, I had so much fun. I want to do it again. And so uh, this fall, I took a shovel out there. And I'm like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. It's going to take all day long. And so I started digging. And right away, I was just fascinated about how wide and how deep these roots actually went. And once I got enough digged around one of them, I got down and I grabbed the root. And I twisted so it would release everything from the dirt. And I pulled up. And it was amazing. Like, if you ever, like, pulled a weed from your garden and you, like, twist and you can just, like, feel it release and you pull up and you see the very end of it and you're like, yes, I feel amazing right now. This is so awesome. And so I, like, after one, I thought it was going to be, like, a dreading, but I looked down and I was like, I have 99 more. And so... <laughs> I go in, and I put on, like, pump-up music, and I just start, like, here we go. And so I go out, and one by one, I just grab, and I twist, and I pull, and I throw it into the pile, and I say, take that, sucker! And it just became this, like, personal vendetta between me and these roots. And I'm like, why? Because they have, they have to come out if I want to thrive next year. And so that's what the verse of this Hebrews verse is saying, is that we have to get these poisonous roots out. Because they take up room in our heart. Because when we, when we drink the love of, of Jesus, when we th- drink the power of the cross, it's so much lighter, so much better than what we're choosing when we hold on to bitterness. And so we have to grab and we have to twist and we have to pull out because Hebrews is saying that there is an urgency to bitterness. And so these next, this is, this is not on your notes. This is a little bonus content for all of you today, okay? You're lucky because we have the danger of bitterness. Bitter roots start small. Again, with, with a flower, you can't see what's happening under the ground. You think it's just like this small, but what happens is it keeps spreading and spreading and spreading. And what you thought was small ends up being way bigger than you realize. And it, bitterness kind of works like cancer When you catch it on the front end, it's easier to treat. But when you catch it too late, you have a lot of work to do. Bitter roots start small, and bitter roots want time. Bitter roots want time. Unaddressed hurt will turn into hate. There's enough time. Unaddressed hurt will turn into hate. And bitterness can sound like a broken record. I'm sure you've seen this with someone. When they see someone every time, and they're like, ugh. That person, uh, 1985, and you're like, what? 1985, like that was so long ago. What happened in 1985? They're like, actually, now I come to think of it, I don't really remember. And like that's bitterness wants time, and it can just fester down deeper than we realize and circle back and forth, back and forth. Bitter roots want time, and bitter roots spread outward. Like I said, what you thought just was hurting you really spread into your neighbor's yard. It hurts your family, your business, and your future. And then bitter roots will destroy. Bitter roots will destroy. Hate in your heart is not going to kill anyone but you. And there's this quote that I heard a long time ago. It it stuck with me. I went right to it when I knew I was teaching on this. It says, bitterness is like setting yourself on fire and hoping the other dies from inhaling smoke. Talk about a quote right there. I mean, it's a little morbid, but like how, there's so much truth to that, isn't it? Because bitterness, who is it really hurting? You or the other person? Often the other person doesn't even know it's happening. It's just hurting you. And so, yes, you're like, I agree. There is urgency to bitter. Yes, bitterness is bad, but what do we do? And that's why I want to, Look at a story that Matthew 18, Jesus tells of this servant that owed a lot of money. So starting at the beginning, it says, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, 
one of his debtors was brought in who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, a talent is the, their highest form of currency. So like our $100 bill. And he says he couldn't pay this. So his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, everything he owned to pay his debt. Once again, we see bitterness not hurting just him. His wife and his children were going to be thrown into jail as well. And right from the beginning of the story, we're like, Oof, this guy is in some big trouble. Like, I can see that this is a big deal, but we don't know what 10,000 talents is. Like, we don't know what to compare that to. But right when, like in the cultural context, when the king would have told this to the servant, everyone would have lost their minds. Everyone's mouth would have dropped to the ground. Some people would have fainted because they would have known right away that no, this person, no one could ever pay back this much. But again, we're like, what, how much is it? And so I want to kind of put this into our context. One talent is that he owed 10,000 talents. One talent is, was their average yearly salary, just one. And so I did some research. Um, in Iowa, our average yearly salary is $50,000, $50,000. So let's take that times 10,000, because it said 10,000 talents, and we get Five with a bunch of zeros. We're like, I don't want to owe that. And we get $500 million. So imagine someone comes up to your door, knocks, and has proof. You owe $500 million. Can you imagine? Like, just thinking about it, it's like, I want to puke right now. That is so much money. But another question to ask is like, who in their right mind would lend out $500 million? That is insane. No one would do that. No king would do that. But what this story is hinting at is that no earthly king would do that. But we don't serve an earthly king, do we? It says we serve a king. Scripture says we serve a king that owns cattle on a thousand hills. And he is a giver. And what did our life, what did our king lend us? He lended us life. So right now, think about how, value your, how valuable your life is. Can you put a price tag on your life? No, it's so valuable. But our God said, here you go. This is yours. So for no strings attached, I'm giving this to you. And what, what did we do as humans? We took that life. We turned the other way and we left God. And we created this gap in between him, a debt called sin. And Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Our sin, our debt because of our sin is deep, like so deep. Think of more than $500 million. Think of the biggest number you can think of. We owe zillions and zillions of dollars to God. And listen to this. God has every right, every right to be bitter towards us. God has every right to hate us. But this verse says, so freely, he forgave us and gave us life. And so my first point is don't forget we need forgiveness. Don't forget we need forgiveness. It's simple, but it's sometimes it's just like you need that reminder. Have you ever, have you ever had your credit card declined? Like you hear that awful noise you never want to hear. And like, beep, beep, and you're like, what happened? And like your credit card was declined. And you're like, What? No, and I know when like your credit card, from experience, you get really weird when your credit card declines and because you start telling this person like way more information than he wants to know. You're like, no, 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 I have so much money in my bank account. Look, I listen to these podcasts. Dave Ramsey has me on this like emergency. He's like, I don't care. There's nothing he can do, is there? Because declined is a decline. And if you think that's embarrassing to have your credit card decline in front of a worker, imagine what it's like standing in front of God and realizing that there's such a great gap, there's such a big debt that there's no ties, there's no amount of ties and giving, there's no amount of numbers of times you've come to church, there's no amount of good morals or a big work ethic that you can pay that debt that we owe God. But, we know, right? We know there's a but. The good news doesn't end there. And the, the next part of the story tells us about a hints towards that good news. It says, but the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. 
Then his master was filled with pity for him. If you ever seen like a good movie, what does a good movie have? It has an amazing twist to it. Here is an amazing twist. As we read this story, it says he was filled with pity and then he released him and forgave his debt. And we're just like, that is insane. I mean, it's not surprising how the servant reacted, right? If you owed $500 million, I mean, like, the only thing to do is like, please, please be patient with me. Please forgive me. And that's what the servant did. But what's insane is what the king did. He just said, $500 million? Okay, you asked, forgiven. Done. I've forgotten about it. And this is what the principle is here. This is what the story is pointing to, is that repentance leads to forgiveness in the kingdom of God. Repentance leads to forgiveness in the kingdom of God. Can you imagine just being forgiven $500 million? What would you do? Like, what would you do? I remember where I was standing in Birmingham, Alabama with my wife when we got a call that my medical bill for $3,000 was forgiven. And we just did like a little dance. We didn't care what people were thinking, what they thought. $3,000. Imagine $500 million. I think I would invite all of you over to my house to throw a big party, $500 million forgiven. Uh, I was learning from this teacher uh, not too long ago, and every time that we would praise and worship together, uh, he would do, I don't even know what to call it, but he would do this like little dance shimmy across like the front of the stage here, and he would just be up here doing this. Like, while he was praising, his arms were, like, always tucked high, and sometimes you would throw them up. And the first time I saw it, I was like, what? Like, what? That is so, like, does he know he's in public? Does he know people can see him? Like, how embarrassing. But the more I got to know this person, the more I just realized he was the most thankful person for his life. Every time that he would tell a story about his kids and his grandkids and his wife, every time he would choke up and cry. I was like, Whew. And the more I think about this story and the context of it, I realize that dancing makes sense. When we, we realize how much God has so freely forgiven, in that context, dancing makes sense. And so there's a reason that we start every single service with praise and worship. There's a reason we clap our hands. There's a reason we raise our hands. Like with baptisms, I said, hey, when they come out, go nuts. Why? Because God has already done more than enough. If he doesn't do one more thing, it's been enough. And so the question we ask is like, well, we know it was crazy to, to lend $500 million out, but why would a king forgive $500 million? Why, why did God forgive us of our sins so easily? And the Bible's not saying here that it's easy to forgive. I want you to hear that. It's not, the Bible's not saying it's a natural instinct to forgive. What the Bible is saying or more pointing towards is that is who God is. It's simple. That is who God is. He forgives our God heals, our God saves, our God delivers, our God promises, our God sets us on the right path, our God sets us free. That's who he is. And he made that decision before we decided to turn the other way and walk in the wrong direction. He made that decision. He was going to have that heart, that, that shame, that, that instance, that circumstance in your life that you were playing over and over and over in your head that the enemy is trying to use against you. God's already chosen to forgive. I love what Psalm 85 verse 5 says. It says, oh Lord, you are so good and so ready to forgive. I love that. Ready to forgive. Future tense. So full of unfailing love for all who ask for your help. And so my next point is we have to make a predetermined faith decision. The people that I see let go of bitterness well have already made up the decision in their hearts that they are going to forgive on the front end, on the front end. And we don't think about that too often when it comes to forgiveness, right? When we think of forgiveness, we think of something that has already happened. But what if we rewired our brain? What if we thought about it in the future tense? The, the um, prayer that Jesus teaches us 
how to pray. And many of you probably haven't memorized. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That earth as in heaven, give us day, our daily bread. For me, it's gluten-free bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass. Again, and that word forgive in there, I was doing the study once, and it blew my mind that that word forgive was future tense. How much would that change if in the morning we said, God, would you give me the forgiveness I need today? I know I'm going to come across people that wrong me. Would you give me the power right now? Would your presence fill me so much that I can forgive them when it happens? When you're going to work, we know, oh man, these people got issues. These people got problems. These people are messy. Give me the power to forgive them on the front end. Think about how much that would change. And so we have to make a predetermined faith decision. When it comes to purity, we're going to make a predetermined faith decision. If this device is dangerous to have in my house for my soul, I'm going to make the predetermined faith decision. I'm going to sell that device. Or I'm going to make sure it is monitored by an accountability partner. I'm going to make a predetermined faith decision when it comes to our tithes and offering. I'm not going to wait until the end of the year to see what I have left. I'm going to make a predetermined faith decision. I'm going to give God my first. I'm going to give God my best when it comes to forgiveness. We do this so often. We're not, let's not wait. Let's not wait and to see what they do of like, ooh, ooh, that was worse than what I would have done. How often do we do that? Try to compare their offense to something we've done and make us feel about it. No, we're going to make the predetermined faith decision to forgive. And so next time someone says, so-and-so said this about you, guess what we're going to do? Oh, we're going to blow their minds. Get this, get this. It's going to be crazy. We're going to say, oh, well. Oh, well, bless them. And the only way that we can do that is if we already have forgiveness in our heart from our Lord that flows through us. Church, your faith trumps everything. And I know, I just, I know that I have a calling. I have a purpose. And it, so much so that I'm, I'm ready to let go of that bitterness that's holding me back. So let me summarize what happens next in this story that Jesus is telling because another huge twist happens. It says that servant, after just been forgiven so much money, he walks out back into the world and he finds someone that owed him money. And the word that he said it owed him a hundred denarii, which that back to our context is about eight thousand dollars, which is a significant amount, but nothing compared to five hundred million dollars. And it says he grabbed this man, he choked this man, and he had him thrown into prison. And we're in the story like, how? How could he do that? That's so irrational. But that's just it. Sin is irrational. Bitterness is irrational. And when the king hears about this, it says he gets very upset. And he, he's like, whoa, 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 whoa. You're saying you could receive forgiveness, but you could not give forgiveness? And it, it says that he has the servant thrown back into jail, tortured until he could pay his debt. And this next verse, Jesus ends the story by telling the people, and it, honestly, it's hard to hear. It says, that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. So my last point is we have to walk what you talk. You think since this person had just been given so much grace and mercy that he would carry out that same posture for others, right? You're like, he was given so much, surely he's going to give that to someone else, but instead he chose bitterness. Instead he chose justice. Instead he chose revenge. And how many of us get in that same mindset, right? Like we talk forgiveness, but we walk bitterness. We say mercy for me. I want mercy. That sounds good, but justice for you. Mercy for me justice for you. Mercy for me, justice for you. And what happens is we come to church and we're like, God, I need you in my life. God, come. And God moves and mi miracles happen and amazing things happen. But what happens is we leave church and Monday we find reasons that people don't deserve what we also don't deserve. Church, listen up. Bitterness indicates that we underestimate our sins against God and overestimate 
the sins done against us. Sin, let me say that again, bitterness points, if we still have bitterness in our hearts, it points that we underestimate our sins against God, but overestimate the sins done against us. We find ways to be like, yeah, what, I, what I've done against God, that's not as bad as what other people have done against me. And that mindset is toxic. And here's the irony of this story. We find ourselves, as we're reading this, we're like, oh, yep, we are the servant. But we are acting like kings. Mercy for me, justice for you. But the only reason that, that, that debt was forgiven for us in our lives the only reason that we were set free is that a king came as a servant and he served us. Your hate for others is killing you. It's suffocating you on the inside. And I want you to ask yourself right now, is there bitterness in your life? Is there bitterness, is there bitter roots, bitter seeds? Maybe from childhood, that are still there, maybe from last year, or maybe right now you're in the middle of your nightmare. Maybe you have to have some self-honesty with yourself today. These, this is here, but I'm here to tell you the good news is that we have a great surgeon that can grab those roots, twist them, and pull them out and make room in your heart because that pain is heavy, I know. But what God can provide is he can take that from you. He can take that heaviness off your shoulders and because of him leading the way, going to the cross, because he hung on the cross for you and me, we don't have to like create forgiveness or create this energy. We don't have to do anything. It's done and final. What we get to do is pass it on. What we get to do is pass it on. We are all sinners. We are all imperfect. Let's say I sinned once a day. There's 365 days in the year. I'm 26 year old, years old. Do all that multiplication. That's 9,490 times, probably minimum, right? Probably minimum. Imagine if my wife kept count of my sin, of all my wrongdoings. How do you think our marriage would be? <laughs> Not good. Not good. We probably wouldn't still be together. Now imagine if God kept count of your wrongdoings, of your sin, of your mistakes. But because of what Jesus did on the cross, God does not have to keep count anymore. And I think that's a lesson for us today is don't keep count. Don't keep count. Human forgiveness is dependent on divine forgiveness. Human forgiveness, horizontally, what we share with our brothers and sisters is dependent on what Jesus has done for us. It flows through us to others. And as God forgives again and again and again and again, daily, we too are called to forgive again and again and again. So church, um, I'm gonna ask you just to bow your heads and pray with me. Father, I know that this topic has such a weight to it. It's hard for so many people because darkness is real. We've been hurt. So that's why I pray your supernatural peace would just fill this room right now in only ways that you can, God. Overwhelm us with your presence as we call on you, Lord, to help set us free where we've been imprisoned for so long. So God, search our heart. We pray that bold prayer right now. Search my heart. If there's anything that's not supposed to be there, take it from me. Maybe it's bitterness towards your mom for criticizing you over and over. Maybe it's bitterness towards your dad for abandoning you. Maybe it's bitterness towards a friend for lying towards, to you. Maybe it's bitterness towards a Christian or the church because they hurt you. Maybe it's bitterness towards God for allowing bad things to happen. Maybe there's someone here today that's ready to let go. Like, I can't hold on to this pain anymore. It's suffocating me. It hurts. It's heavy. So God, through your power, would you allow us to let go? May you just put your hands out in front of you with your hands open wide, just this 
posture of surrender, of letting go. God, there are enemies in our life. But through your power, we have the ability to step out and bless them. So God, I pray a blessing over those people that are in our mind right now. It's only you that can take a hard heart and make it soft. It's only you that can take the meanest person and make them kind. And so Lord, we bless them. We let them go. And as we continue to pray, I wonder if there's someone in here today that's like, you can't give what you have not received. And maybe you walked in here today and you're hearing this and you're like, there's no way I would qualify for the forgiveness that God offers. But the reality is that none of us deserve it. But through the power of Jesus, we have access to it. Bible says we've all sinned, whether it be a millimeter or a mile, we've missed the mark. But the good news is that when Jesus hung on the cross and said it was finished, he paid for our debt in full. And all you have to do is call out on his name. Right now, if you want to call out on his name, and if you're ready for that, I, I just want to lead you, would you say this simple prayer with me? Father, I need you. I have sinned. I have made mistakes. And I'm asking for forgiveness this morning. Jesus, thank you for giving me life. Thank you for paying for my sin. And I give you all of me today. I commit my life to you. Use my life to bring you glory. And I'm choosing right now, I'm going to give you all the praise and all the honor. Because you deserve it all. And we pray this in your mighty name. Come on, and God's people said... Amen. Amen.